Good evening. My name is Ehsan and I'm the Surgical Neuro-Oncology Fellow at Dahal Khan University Hospital. On behalf of the Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology, PASNO, I welcome you all to this session. PASNO is organizing the Neuro-Oncology webinar series and each session will be an hour long and held on alternate Saturdays. All attendees will be muted to enable the speaker to present without any interruption. Questions can be submitted in the chat box and will be answered once the presenter has finished their talk. Attendees can also raise their hands for questions. We will unmute them to speak. The session will be recorded and the link will be shared on the PASNO website. The speaker will take 30 minutes for topic presentation and after that, there will be an open discussion between our esteemed speaker, Dr. Ashid Juma, Dr. Atharinam and the attendees. The topic of today's session is on the management of medulloblastomas in the contemporary era, balancing cures and quality of cure. And today we are honored to have Dr. Rakesh Jalali as our speaker. Dr. Jalali is medical director and head radiation oncology at Apollo Proton Center in Chennai, India. Dr. Rakesh Jalali is an internationally renowned key opinion leader in oncology, particularly known for high precision radiotherapy techniques. Over the years, he has done path-breaking research in the field of cancer treatment, enhancing quality of life for cancer patients, and developing appropriate research models. Dr. Jalali obtained MBBS in 1990 from Government Medical College, Jammu University of Jammu in India, and Doctor of Medicine in Radiotherapy and Oncology in 1994 from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh in India. He was a senior researcher at the academic unit of the Royal Merson NHS Trust London in 1998 in the stereotactics radiotherapy program. The neuro-oncology group at Tata Memorial Hospital was developed by Dr. Jalali and it is hailed as one of the best units in India and recognized throughout the world. Dr. Jalali was instrumental in establishing the Indian Society of Neuro-Oncology in 2008. He served as its founding founding general secretary, then its president, and now chairing its senior advisory council. He also founded the Brain Tumor Foundation of India, an internationally recognized charity organization dedicated to the welfare of the patients with brain tumors and their families. Dr. Jalali has received different awards, including the Best Oncologist Award by Medscape in 2014 and Top Radiation Oncologist Award more than once. Thank you so much, Dr. Jalali, for joining us today. Over to you, sir. Asan, if I have your permission to, I want to just add one thing. Uh, you know, uh, I got, I was introduced to Rakesh by some of the top uh, neuro-oncologists across the world, including Galari Zadeh, she was the president of SNO. And uh, I am forever indebted to Rakesh uh, for helping me set up PASNO. So, you know, Rakesh may be younger, to, younger than me, but he's my mentor in this. So I respect you, Rakesh, for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Inam, and uh, I'm privileged and honored to be participating in what you have already started, a fascinating society and much needed. And this was, I was just a small little thing. You already had evolved so much and put so much effort. But the great thing is in our parts of the world with the challenges that we have, uh, in spite of that, forming a platform nationally to get people all together with a common dream such that people from other parts of the world receive uh, exactly the same treatment as anywhere part of the world. So that is the common uh, kind of a principle and both of us and many of our colleagues share. So it is with great uh, pride and pleasure that I participate in today's seminar. And uh, I thank you for inviting me. And also I had a lovely chat with your fellow Hassan and he was very sweet and uh, in his kind introduction. So I straight away go to the topic. And today we will discuss on medulloblastomas, particularly how we perceive the disease in the contemporary era. And it's one of those tumors, which is a high grade malignant tumor, grade four, yet has a reasonably good survival outcomes. And therefore the balance between achieving long-term cure and the quality of cure become, becomes very important as well. And I'll try to address this issue in the subsequent, talk, uh, subsequent slides in my talk as well. Now, many of you know, uh, I'm trying to move the slides. Okay, 
So many of you know uh, uh, Harvey Cushing actually and Bailey described the disease many, many years ago. It's almost a century ago where he felt that there were some tumors in the childhood which resembled what he at that time called it medulloblastoma. And way back in 1930s, there was a first attempt also at X-ray therapy, which had just been discovered in the Ronjan therapy. And they found out that it was actually one of the first evidence of it being a radiosensitive tumor. There was no evidence of the tumor later on, al although many of these patients had radiation necrosis. So this was among the first insights of this tumor. Over a period of time, we have of course now realized that it is the commonest childhood malignant brain tumor, is a classic in oncology, what we call small blue round cell tumor, which gives a connotation of it being radiosensitive and chemosensitive. We have also come to know there are three distinct histological patterns in the classic era. So there is the classic histology, there is the distinct nodular desmoplastic histology, which is now correlated many times with the molecular subgrouping, which we'll discuss in the subsequent slides. And we also recognize this entity called large cell anaplastic, which was particularly aggressive and was associated with poor prognosis. Way back, we also quickly realized that there was a very high degree of propensity of CSF dissemination. And therefore, we had to take care of not only the tumor surgically where it was, but also address the rest of the CSF space. The current standard of care is, of course, to achieve maximal safe resection as much as you can remove, followed by adjuvant craniospinal access radiation, what is called CSI, plus chemotherapy. And it is one of the curable childhood tumors. Traditionally, we now know that they were divided into two classic risk categories. The average risk category, this is about 20 year old now, the high risk category, dependent upon the age, the younger the patient, they were high risk. If you had a little bit more residual tumor, more than 1.5 square centimeter, and of course, if they had metastasis, and the metastasis ranged from M1 to M4, depending upon whether it was only limited to CSF, or it was limited to gross disease, either in the spine or in the brain. Now, within uh, also in the last 15, 20 years, we realized that the medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity, it is not synonymous with desmoplasia. Sometimes there can be desmoplastic tumors, but may not have MBN. And MBN is definitely a more favorable group, LCI already mentioned. MIC amplification has now been realized is a particularly a poor prognosis and those countries and those regions who may not have the full molecular profiling, but if they have the MIC, because MIC can be done in many other cancers also, can be used in their setup. If it's amplified, then it straight away becomes an aggressive high risk. And it has been also deemed that it is one of those tumors which has probably a, one of the greatest apparent improvement in survival, certainly in the last 20, 30 or 40 years. Now, there are some other points also which we have recognized that if you have operated upon a patient, you do a scan. These days, we do try to do the scans within 48 to 72 hours or even a little bit later sometimes. And there's an obvious gross disease. There is a case for second look surgery. And in our setup, especially in my previous hospital in Mumbai, the Tata Memorial, there were uh, sometimes cases coming where we had to resort to second look surgery because you can easily downgrade from high risk to average risk. And the survival rate of high risk is about 30 to 40 or 50%, while average risk is anywhere between 70 to 85%. So at 15 to 20 or 30% benefit you can achieve with second look surgery, of course, you have to balance it out with any post-operative deficit. Uh, as I mentioned, it is imperative that you have immediate post-op scan. Sometimes it has become difficult especially in a young child, but thrust should be done in the center to, to accomplish it. We also have recognized over a period of time the importance of post-operative mutism or posterior fossa syndrome from a surgical perspective. And I have many other experts in the audience who know more than me, but we have also realized that many of them can be can recover quite dramatically in the next few weeks. Although some groups, especially from France, they have tried to correlate the importance of post-op mutism with late-term neurocognitive deficit, which is unproven. And of course, in the last few years, we have seen a revolution in molecular profiling, which I'll be discussing in the next slides. In Tata Memorial, many years ago, I think more than 10 years, 12 years ago, what we did was we did very simple things. Uh, we compared our prospective registry, which I had started in 2003 or 2004, 
and compared our data sets with the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States Cancer Registry with Western Data Group. Nothing, you know, too fancy, very simple things. What are the demographics? What is the age? What is the type of tumor? What is the gender? So on and so forth. In malignant gliomas and in brain metastasis, we realize the average age of presentation in our setup was at least 10 to 15 years younger that was reported in the West, both from the SEER as well as the CBTRO's data. Average age in GBM, for example, in our country is about 48 to 49 years and which is 63 to 64 years in the US. But interestingly, there was not much difference in the childhood tumors, whether it is medulloblastoma, ependymoma, most of the tumors you will see, they were practically more or less the same which means that it was not nothing to do with the children. It was perhaps the average life expectancy that we have in our country, and that skewed the, the data towards the in, in malignant gliomas in adults. So this was interesting. Many of us also came together to publish uh, our national demographic data on the pediatric brain tumors in the country, close to 4,000 odd patients from seven or eight premier centers in different parts of the country and try to see what is the percentage of pediatric brain tumors in their practice. And it was anywhere between 10 to 20% or so. And the medulloblastomas were also anywhere between 10% uh, to 20 to 30%. And the differences were primarily if the databases were primarily from the neurosurgical perspective, for example, Chris CMC Villore was a largely uh, neurosurgical database as compared to say Tata Memorial Hospital, where I used to work, which was primarily a neuro-oncology database. So we were not getting sometimes the benign tumors, everything was not coming to us. Although over a period of time, we tried to capture even those cases, even if they did not need any adjuvant therapy as a part of comprehensive neuro-oncology data set. But this is about 10 years ago data. And uh, this was an interesting uh, kind of a collaborative effort that we put across the country. And, and subsequently in the neuro-oncology group in Tata Memorial, as was mentioned in the introduction, we used to see about 40 to 50 odd patients per year. But very quickly, I think many years ago, we recognized the need of putting them into prospective investigative clinical studies. And that was a very good decision that time. It was funded by the Brain Tumor Foundation of India, partly and partly by some of us pitched in as well. And this was particularly effective in prospective molecular profiling study, which I'll show you in a minute. But we also try to demonstrate what is the outcome data in uh, different series. This was a paper published in the Red Journal many years ago by my colleague, Dr. Gupta, where we did something slightly different, hyperfractionated radiotherapy in average risk medulloblastoma. The data is now actually much more. Now we have the five and 10 year survival data is consistent with any part of the world. This was primarily to give us the confidence that our prospective database and with the outcome analysis, was at par, at least in, in our setup in the hospital was at par with the what, what you would expect in any parts of the world. We also looked at prospective, and this was published, I think in NOP many years ago, again, looking at the hearing loss with hyperfractionary radiation, uh, and also looked at both the right ear and left ear. Again, showed some interesting uh, data from the hearing point and also from the cognitive point of as well. For the high-risk medullo, Dr. Kurkure, who was our chief of pediatric oncology and myself as the PIs, we uh, launched a study of using concurrent carboplatin. And this was in high-risk medulloblastomas. We were very scared initially because giving carboplatin every day to the full dose CSI, which tended to be 35 gray, as you know, in average risk after full resection, we give 23.4, what is called the Packers regimen with the boost along with weekly vincristine followed by six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. But with the high risk disease, we have to give 35 gray in 21 fractions, followed by the boost about 54 to 55 gray. And in added, we also added concurrent carboplatin to it. And uh, we were not sure that they will tolerate the, uh, both the carboplatin on a daily basis. And there was a COG pilot study being done and uh, was being accruing that time as well. So this uh, we launched, I think, about seven, eight years ago. And uh, this was published earlier this year in the pediatric blood cancer. And what we have demonstrated in a reasonably large cohort, close to 100 patients with a really very long follow up, seven to eight years in a high risk medulloblastoma, the five year, perf uh, the PFS and the OS was actually quite surprisingly good to about 60%. Hitherto, it was always thought to be about 35 to 40 to 50%. 
And they were in a clinical trial, they were prospectively, there was more effort to put to these, to these cases, but nevertheless, again, uh, gave credence to the incorporation of carboplatin to this schedule. Many of these patients did need uh, growth factors, but we demonstrated that it is feasible even in an LMIC setting. And that has become the standard of care in many centers in the country following the publication of this study. In the past, as you know, we had tried to balance out uh, to looking at the long-term side effects, particularly from the chemotherapy and radiation, how to achieve that balance. And in the US, there was a study where they tried to reduce the dose of craniospinal radiation from 23.4 with Winkelstein uh, with the boost to 54 uh, down to 1800. And this study had to be actually stopped because there were too many failures of 1800 gray and that does not has not become the standard of care. This was in the pre-molecular era. Although we did find some interesting data that once you reduce the dose of radiation, the IQ scale, the, uh, the different domains of the IQ as well as on the hearing were significantly better, giving again the uh, giving us an insight that higher doses of radiation, unfortunately, although is needed for tumor control, do uh, become uh, are resulting into higher cognitive and hearing loss, and that was an interesting, you know, it was an important point to understand in our setup as well. Now, many of you know the path-breaking work from Paul Northcott Group, Michael Taylor from Canada, and the Heidelberg from. From, from, the, from, from Germany. Uh, I remember the first time I saw Mike Taylor speaking about 10 years ago, it was just absolutely mind blowing how he said that medulloblastoma is not one disease, it is four diseases. We now know that they belong to distinct molecular subgroups, the wind pathway, the sonic hedgehog pathway, the group three and the group four. Initially it was based on microarray technology and there were distinct uh, subtypes depending upon the age, for example, uh, you know, there is a particular age where you do not, may not see wind pathway. The sonic hedgehog can be seen in infants, can be seen in pediatric, but also can be seen in older adults. Group three is seen in very young children. Wind pathway, you will almost never see less than three years of age. And group four is the commonest group, which can be seen in many, many sites. And you look, look at the survivals. The survival uh, is exceedingly good in wind pathway, almost 95 to 100%. The worst is the group three and the sonic hedgehog and group four fall in between the two. And that was irrespective of the group stratification, the average risk and high risk. There was some correlation, but it beautifully kind of fell out in the four distinct survival graphs looking at the molecular profiling. And this was a revelation that has been subsequently proved in many, many other centers in the world. And this was a recent publication looking at the demographic profiles, the survival profile, as well as the subgrouping analysis for this type of patients. Now, the question is, how do you do the grouping? The first things was very, very complex based on microarrays. Very commonly done is a nano string commercial platform, primarily uh, done by the German group as well as the Canadian group. The latest and the most complex and most expensive is the DNA methylation. In our hospital group, we were very keen that we cannot have the fresh tissue because fresh tissue is very difficult to get in other parts of the world. So can we do it on uh, you know, fixed formalin paraffin blocks, embedded blocks? And we devised a technique of microRNAs, and this was relatively simple. And I know Dr. Inam has also some interest in microRNA. And we also had the IHC platform, which now subsequently WHO adopted as well. So in our neuro-oncology basic lab, uh, Dr. Neelam Shirsat was our leading scientist and in Tata Memorial Hospital, we have a research wing as well as the clinical wing, and there is a quite a nice interaction as one would expect. So we uh, initially, she had published many years ago, in fact, even before Paul Northcott on the FA matrix gene uh, array, microarrays, also looking at initially, she thought there will be five groups and Marcel Kuhl initially from Germany also thought there would be five groups and eventually it came out to be four groups. So she, she is actually one of the pioneers to devise the molecular subgroupings in way back at the same time when it was discovered in the world. But as I mentioned, we were very keen to do it on FFPP on just the paraffin blocks. And we realized that the classic histology and when they have low MIC, they do much better. And this was based on what we call TMH assay, Tata Memorial Hospital assay, which looks at 
12 coding genes and nine microRNAs, relatively simple, just done by a simple RT-PCR technology. And uh, this was done quite nicely. And this paper was published, I think in 2014 in neuro-oncology. What is also interesting, and some of you may bear with me and, uh, and kind of uh, 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 you know, understand what I'm trying to say. Many of the times when we try to collaborate with the Western people, they are always looking after our samples because we have such a large patient number. So, but this is one of the case examples where actually when we did the micro RNA, we didn't send the sample, actually they sent us the sample, our German colleagues, Stefan Pfister, Paul Northcott and Andre Korchno, who were our co-authors. So they sent our samples, they were trying to test whether our micro RNA is good. But interestingly, uh, the microRNA passed the test they were doing on the fresh tissue. We showed them it was possible on FFPE. We correlated between the frozen and FFPP. And then we had the training set of our own tumors. And the test set was the DKFZ Heidelberg. And there was an excellent correlation, except one patient where there was a discorrelation because everything was correlated. And therefore, this became the standard of care. And they became our co authors in the paper. We also now have a nanostring platform. And we uh, to either ways in, in, in Bombay and many other parts of the, of the country. We went on to look at other aspects also. I won't bore, to it, bore you with the, this uh, these work, but this is very well published and whosoever is interested or would like to come in touch with us, we'll be very happy to collaborate. Looking at different aspects of micro RNAs in group three, group four. We also looked at the wind pathway. We were particularly interested. There was a down regulation of a tumor suppressor microRNA, which we think is possibly related to why the wind pathways do very, very well and, and so on and so forth. And we can discuss subsequently on it as well. So simultaneously, my colleagues from the Ordinary of Medical Sciences from Delhi, they looked at the IHC because the WHO was looking at the IHC pattern because they had distinct protein markers, which could be seen on the IHC platform, the beta catenin, nuclear beta catenin on the wind pathway, the sonic hedgehog and GAV1 and YAP1, and they were called non-wind, non-SH. It was very easy to do. This was again published in Brain Pathology a few years ago, and my colleagues from NIMHANS in, in Bangalore also looked at the IHC pattern and looked at again in a reasonably cohort just to validate what has been already described in the literature and also has become the standard of care in different parts of the world. So the advantages are that you need only a paraffin block, although the TMHLC also needs a paraffin block. The advantage is that you can see the wind, non-wind and SHH. It cannot, however, differentiate between group three and group four, which is also important in some times. Uh, that is the only limitation and the WHO actually says that you should do IHC because it is relatively easy to do. I don't know what you do in Pakistan, but uh, this is not so difficult to do on IHC pattern. I'm sure some of the labs must be doing out there as well. Uh, but uh, uh, so it has some advantages. The only disadvantage is it cannot differentiate between uh, group three and group four. And this was just again a relatively simple way to characterize molecularly uh, distincting, uh, you know, distinguishing different subgroups of metroblastoma. Some of you have already seen, I've shared with Dr. Inam also last year, uh, that led us to, we every year we try to get some guidelines on a particular uh, brain tumor type. This is a collective national effort from different experts on the group. We have a series of meetings that we meet up in our annual meeting. And in the next one year, we try to publish our guidelines. We publish in Neurology India because it is widely read in our parts of the world. This was our first tumor type, which we chose as the guideline paper. And subsequently, we have made four other guidelines over a period of time. So we try to become very simple, try to see the different pathology platforms, try to see how you should do the MRI approaches, how you should do the surgical approaches, what is the adjuvant chemotherapy protocol. And it's out there. I'm sure some of you may have already read it. We also looked at in this, there is a supplementary files also at the end of the of the article, which looks at the simple things like positioning, which approach you want to use, what are the potential post-operative complications, what should be the brain protocol for these patients. And what saddens us is that sometimes the spine is not, and then we just operate. All posterior fossa tumors should have a spine screening even preoperatively. And whether it is a medulloblastoma or an ependymoma, we know about it, even brainstem gliomas and pilostic sometimes can have uh, spinal metastasis does become the standard of care. And these are widely practiced in the country, at least in other parts of the world and maybe in other parts as well. We also detailed about the craniospinal radiation. As we know, CSI is an extremely complex 
radio therapeutic technique and my if there are any radiation oncologists in the audience they will bear with me that uh, you know this is one of the tests that we ask the students whether they can do a csi because you have to include the cribriform plate you have to be very careful to look at the, all the leptomeningeal uh, uh, wherever there is a lining of it you go to the thecal sac up to s2 s3 yet try to uh, reduce the doses you have to look at the temporal fossa very careful there is a junction out there there is a very complex rapidly changing geometry and how to overcome it we also uh, recognized long time ago we should do it in supine no longer in prone so that was that part bit we traditionally most of it use the packers regimen although some of the group you do use relatively more intense st jude's metalloblastoma protocol which is slightly more more intense uh, there is very little to choose between packer and as i mentioned there were several pathology platforms to distinguish the molecular profiling for this now there is a bit of a debate about the surgery with respect to the molecular subgrouping and this was a published paper in the lancet oncology about 4 5 years ago and it says that group 4 in particular uh, it did make a difference when whether it was uh, near total resection as compared to subtotal resection in the sub other groups it did not make any difference although our emphasis is always to achieve complete resection or near total resection as long as it is safe with except perhaps wind subgroup and which i think will come in the next slides as well we also launched a prospective study during that time and dr das gupta who was my student that time i gave this thesis to him what we did was blinded in a prospective fashion every single metalloblastoma for about 3 years or so in our joint tumor board clinic we laid out several uh, uh, mri findings and we put them prospectively and we blinded with the molecular pathologist and looked at different characteristics which we could predict just in the clinic in fact uh, we went on when the child used to come in the clinic we used to tell our students which what is it likely to be is it likely to be wind pathway group 3 group 4 and so on and so forth it was a lot of fun as we have realized the wind pathways are the ones they are actually quite enhancing they can be in the center but they are the ones which can be slightly towards the cp angle and uh, they are very very well as you know 10 to 15% of these patients belong to wind pathway and they have an exceedingly good survival more than 95 to 100%. Sonic hedgehog is quite varied it can be in the midline in the infants in the adults can be lateral what we always used to call desmoplastic sonic hedgehog. Wind pathway can be enhancing mainly in the center so we have sometimes difficulty in the central tumors to distinguish and group 4 which is the commonest has very distinct radiology they are relatively poorly enhancing they don't enhance so much and they are relatively inferior towards going to the foramen magnum it's almost like an ependymoma if you see on the sagittal in the sonic hedgehog in a blinded fashion and after some time we opened that what the molecular subgroup was and looked at the correlation and was published i think two years ago or three years ago that overall accuracy was in two thirds we could correctly predict what the subtype was on on an mri scan and this is relevant in those countries where the molecular profiling may not be available sonic hedgehog we were almost always correct and we hardly ever faltered in shh we had group 3 also pretty good we had difficulty in wind and group 3 which was about 50% or so and there was a learning curve and these days if we do the study again i think some of us can do slightly better than what we published a few years ago and this is important as well now sonic hedgehog we had great excitement because this was one tumor uh, and this was a case report in NEGM. NEGM rarely publishes case report, but this was a case report where they had discovered a smoothened inhibitor, GDC449, with a metastatic disease, but it was in an adult sonic hedgehog related medulloblastoma. Dramatic response as a targeted therapy. But as we know, in target therapies, after a few months, the disease came back. But this was a proof of principle study that uh, you could possibly use targeted therapies in this. But we have also realized over a period of time, unfortunately, in infants where we want them to work because we don't want to give too much radiation, they have this what is called SUFU mutation and MIC amplification. And they unfortunately, uh, they do not work so well. And so is the case in children between three to seven years because many of them are P53 mutant, which we realized have realized that is a bad prognostic sign, particularly from the data from the sick kids in Toronto and has been uh, multi and validated in many other centers as well. And because of the P53 mutation or GLE2 amplification, they do not work. So they may work in adults, 
We have been waiting for many years for it to come into the clinical practice. Unfortunately, it still has not come into routine clinical practice, but there is at least food for thought to look at targeted therapy in at least one subgroup of medulloblastomas. And hopefully in the next few years, we will see some other data. Dr. Gadas Gupta Archo also was instrumental in collecting this data as was published last year from our group two years ago that we identified SHH only at the SHH is a relatively large subgroup in one institution that infantile NSHH do extremely well there in the center. They are erstwhile called desmoplastic infantile where they do very well with chemotherapy alone or very focal radiation. The pediatric SHH was the worst because they have extensive leptomeningeal metastasis and they relapse very quickly outside the tumor bed. The adult sub SHH also do not do so badly, although the relapses tend to occur more than two to three years. And most of the relapses are local. So there is a case that whether we should escalate the therapy in the local, both surgical and radiation. But adult SHH is also the subgroup where occasionally you will have extra neural metastasis. And uh, our group published this data in, in GNO a few years ago on the extra neural metastasis in this subgroup of patients as well. Some of you may have seen this paper already in the adults, in the AYA, the, ad the adolescent and young adult and adult population. Again, one of the largest series in the world of 162 prospectively collected data set and uh, has already shown distinct survival differences between the LCA and non-LCA. And also the, the molecular profiling was available in a large group of patients as well. And the wind pathway, of course, again, does exceedingly well. And the SHH does intermediate and non-wind on SHH because many of them belong to group three. They do not do so well. And this was, again, a very interesting thought in, that, in this group of patients. Infantile medulloblastoma, always a challenge. What to do? We don't want to give radiation uh, in, in very young children. It has surgical challenges as well, particularly with the presentation, with the hydrocephalus, how to achieve the CSF drainage, and so on and so forth. But most of the data now suggests that if they have sonic hedgehog, desmoplastic, because Stefan Rutskowski many years ago uh, found out that you could do away with radiation in about a percentage of the patients and was subsequently validated uh, the data set in, in, in uh, 10 years later as well. Uh, but the trouble is that you have to identify the subgroup very well and you could possibly give a focal radiation and try to avoid CSI. Uh, but we have also realized that if they are non-desmoplastic, they may not do very well, especially if they are P53 mutant and there you have to give CSI, you can't, uh, you can't avoid it. So this is still one of the challenges, medlo infantile medulloblastomas, but there are, I think, small advantages. And if you incorporate radiation, particularly even less than three years, even if it is focal in a non-metastatic setting, the prognosis is not so bad as we were thinking in the past. Now, medulloblastoma is also one of those cases, and this was a young gentleman who I treated with that. He was a high-risk medulloblastoma with leptomeningeal metastasis and actually presented one of the ASNO meetings, which we hosted in Mumbai in 2013. He gave actually a beautiful talk about his, about his, about his journey. And he was an upcoming confident young man, and all of us have similar long-term survivor stories who lead normal, near normal lives. He's a very successful businessman now. But almost at the same time, 2009, I had another child with almost the same disease with leptomeningeal. I also gave carboplatin and uh, CSI to that, was doing exceedingly well. And 2017 presented with this kind of picture where there was a complete, um, uh, there was a facial nerve palsy, there were cranial, we had to put on steroids. We were thinking whether it is a recurrence or a second cancer or what it is, but finally it came out to be pontine necrosis. And this was uh, treated actually in another hospital, but I was looking at them in Mumbai. The child is still doing very well. She has responded quite well over a period of time, but this shows you the spectrum of what is called survivorship. So it is not only the survivals, and I showed you the PFS and OS, but it is how to balance these cures with long-term quality of cures. And we know the data from the childhood cancers and also in medulloblastomas, how to see the neurocognitive, the neuropsychological, endocrine, growth retardation, autotoxicity, CVA, vascular events, gonadal toxicity, fertility, second malignant neoplasms. Packer has shown that two to 15% of the cases in long-term can actually develop second cancers. Issues with social endpoints of employment, marriage, social functioning, and so on and so forth. So how to overcome it? 
understanding biology, judicialistic divide, prospective protocols, de-escalation is coming very much in vogue in medulloblastomas, superior technology, whether it is surgery, molecular, photon, proton, and also uh, emphasizes the need of long-term survivorship clinics such that we can redress medical and social challenges which these tumors have. Now, coming uh, a couple of minutes on the molecular stratification, uh, Vijay Raja Swami, Ramaswamy's group in Canada has actually shown this beautiful study where they now categorize medulloblastoma in low risk, standard risk, high risk, and very high risk. And there is a case for wind pathway, favorable SHH, not group three, but some of the group four, where you can actually de-escalate the therapies. And uh, Taylor has of course shown the risk category stratification in, in this group pathway as well. Now we, several groups have tried to de-escalate in wind pathway because they do so well long-term. One of the things which we have realized if they are going towards the CP angle, you may not perhaps chase every single millimeter of the tumor tissue there. Even if you leave some of the tumor left behind one, one and a half centimeter, traditionally called high risk, but you don't have to treat like a high risk. You can still give average risk radiation. You can still de-escalate the chemotherapy. And although it is not validated in a prospective study, but most of the people, including our setup in the last five, seven years, we have adopted this approach in wind pathway. Several other groups in the US, the St. Jude's, the SEOP in the Europe, they are trying to de-escalate the radiation dose to 15 to 18 grade CSI. And in Tata Memorial Hospital before, this was one of the last projects I did before I left Tata to Chennai, what we call four wind study, that focal radiation in wind pathway where we used to give only focal radiation. We did have some relapses and we have modified the protocol now to use 18 gray CSI in this group. So there are at least four or five groups in the world in the next two, three years may actually redefine and may change the practice in at least wind pathway subgroup. In Sonic Hedgehog, I already showed you how to optimize the therapy. Group three and group four actually need a lot of attention. We try to club them together. We have realized that group four is not so bad actually, particularly if they do not have MIC amplification or at least if they have chromosome eight loss or chromosome 11 loss, then they don't do so, well, so badly and they can have excellent five-year PFS and OS and can be potentially considered for de-escalation therapy along with the wind pathway as well. The other form is of de-escalation therapy is the de-escalating radiation treatment volumes. And this I have been involved in the last three years, particularly from the particle beam therapy, because the proton therapy in particular can reduce the doses to the cochlea, to the heart, to the different organs at risk. And also tremendous benefit is the reduction of second cancer, that the second cancer risk is practically zero with the proton therapy, which is otherwise two to 10 or 15% when the patients live long for 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. So this is a good technology. This was some of the work with Photon because I realized that many of you are, you know, most of you are still using the Photon. And this was the technology that we used in supine technology using the VMAT or tomotherapy. And this can be very nicely done in many, many centers. But as, as I've explained to you, we published our series in the Journal of Global Oncology last year, including data sets of 25 patients, which is now many more, uh, using again a very nice technology. In children, you have to use the, include the vertebral body, but in adults, actually, you can spare the vertebral body completely. And you can see practically no dose whatsoever to the thyroid, to the heart, to the lung, to the GI, to the gonads, and again, yields a very good uh, survivorship issue. I want to draw your attention. Uh, I mean, this is one of our techniques that we use what is called uh, you know, we do three, four to five beams and we arrive at this gradient from one field to another. My radiation oncology colleagues will appreciate this, how we accomplish this very lovely dose distribution and sparing practically the bone completely and zero dose practically, which is absolutely impossible in the photon world. But look at this, uh, which is an international consensus guideline now that most of the childhood cancers have to switch over from photon to proton. Every single medulloblastoma, craniopharyngioma, low-grade glioma, optic pathway glioma, they recommend that we should go to proton. And of course, it is resource intense, expensive, so on and so forth. But over a period of time, hopefully, we should be able to uh, do this better in our patients as well. In older children, if you do this technology, the doses to the vertebral body is much less. So therefore, the toxicity of combining chemotherapy along with this, we know the older people don't tolerate uh, chemotherapy very well. After CSI, they can tolerate it much better. 
this was one of the most fascinating data that one could understand other advantages, but one could not understand how the IQ will be less with particle beam and proton therapy because the whole brain would treat both photon and proton. But this paper from JCO showed that superior IQ data as well. And possibly it is because uh, our group has also shown the doses to the hippocampus being an extremely important in the booster dose to the hippocampus, there can be a reduction to the doses to the hippocampus and can also yield better results from the neurocognitive and memory quotient in these young children and adults. And that can also possibly explain, but this has to be evaluated in prospective studies. Uh, some of us have also demonstrated the use of the reduction of the dose to the hypo, uh, sorry, the, uh, the pituitary hypothalamic axis, and that also can be incorporated to some of these models. Finally, uh, in the last two or three minutes, I want to draw your attention to the global perspective. And that is again, relevant to both of our countries. Now, what is interesting is developing world has tons of cases with very little resources and the cure rates are not so great. The developed world has relatively less cases. This is the pediatric patients, huge amount of resources, and of course the cure rates are higher. So how to bridge the gap? And that is the greatest challenge that we have. In all the emerging countries, and I include Pakistan as well, we have many Indias or many Pakistans within. We have young population, excellent expertise, rapidly developing infrastructure, and yet we have difficult problems. Uh, this is the, the facilities, the neurosurgery fraternity in different parts. I'm sorry, I don't have the Pakistan data, but I'm sure you have the data. We definitely need more neurosurgeons. Uh, we definitely need more radiation machines. Our profile of the patients is completely different. This was a data we published prospectively many years ago that there is dedicated neuro-oncology setups, highly skewed oncologists, social emotional rehab. The most of the funding is still out of the pocket. The percentage of spending on the healthcare as compared to GDP is abysmally low as compared to the Western world. However, interestingly, small percentage can afford anything. And this is the ethical and social dilemma. And the other dilemma, particularly for the researchers, for people like all of you and me, is then how to balance out, should we put our energy into just, just organize a shunt and resect and give conventional treatment or should we do research? And this is, we have published some work on it, how to improve. But I sincerely believe and truly in my heart believe that if you put patients in prospective data, it needs a little bit of investment and effort and time, your outcomes will dramatically improve in, in your patient cohort. And we have to put effort in many ways and you can do twinning because it improves the infrastructure, abandonment, better follow-up, early access to novel technology and this so on and so forth. And I know there's a Pakistan Society of Neuro-Oncology, the PASNO is there. And uh, this, we started the Brain Tuber Foundation of India in 1999, as soon as I joined there. Uh, we started very humbly, and this is Jackie Shroff, one of our film actors. This is a 2002 story. And then we have this art festival. Some of them have donned the page, cover pages of Lancet Oncology. In 2013, we had actually Roger Stoop participating in one of the, one of the, one of the meetings. And we have a separate fund for the TYA Foundation. This is a national archery champion who had actually a brain tumor. We funded his entire foreign uh, uh, training and trips to different games. And you know, there are many other things. We have made a film which is available on the YouTube, Bust That Noma. Uh, this was one of the most fascinating experience of my life to show a cartoon film for children with cancer as to how to deal with them. So it is not easy to practice in a country like ours, both Pakistan and India. But if we work together, if we have the heart and if we have a you know, commitment I think we can make a little difference to our patients and we owe it to them. And uh, I again thank PASNO for giving me this opportunity. And I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Jirali, for such an excellent talk. Amazing. The work that you are doing, everything so inspirational. And now I'd like to ask Dr. Athar and Dr. Juma for their comments, please. Sir. Uh, so, you know, as, as I expected, I, I told Rakesh early on, you, you know, you have that flair. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, um, we have some of uh, very uh, distinguished people uh, join in. Uh, so uh, I, Noreen Mushtaq is here also. She is the one that does the twining with the hospital for sick children. I would like to hear her opinion as well. 
and uh, there are some questions also like Hamza Bajwa has put forth. So I, I'm not going to do anything, uh, say anything. Uh, we can just uh, go to Dr. Rashid Juma to see if he has any comment and then ask Dr. Noreen Mushtaq and then uh, Asan, you can take some questions uh, starting with Hamza Bajwa after that. Thank you. All right, so Dr. Juma, please. So, uh, uh, Dr. Reel, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, um, you know, uh, for uh, neurosurgeons uh, who over many years have been uh, dealing with brain tumors, um, it's, it's very dismal and it's uh, dismaying to look at the results over years, over time, of uh, glioblastomas. Uh, um, but the change that you uh, so nicely highlighted in medulloblastoma is truly remarkable. Um, and it really gives great hope for the whole field of neuro-oncology because it, I, 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 you know, um, I trained and I, I, I practiced in an era where uh, medulloblastoma was uniformly fatal. You know, you, I mean, the, the child had maybe three, four years and, 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 the, and the latter part of those years were riddled with the kind of complications that we used to see um, of uh, recurrences, dissemination, hydrocephalus, so on and so forth. The cures that we're now seeing, and uh, um, we, we're, we're seeing these children in Pakistan as well, uh, treated by our colleagues, uh, is truly remarkable, and uh, I, you know I, I can't praise the work of the neurooncology group enough, the community enough, for bringing us to that this point, uh, which you so nicely highlighted in your talk. So thank you, and I certainly plan to uh, go back to the recording and look at some of the the details of it again. Uh, thank you, Rakesh. Thank you very much. We already have some comments asking about the recording, sir. So, right. so that goes on past now, right? I think there was a uh, yes, uh, response, so yes, it goes in there. Dr. Noreen Mushtaq, if she's here, then we can ask her to share her comments. Dr. Noreen? Yes, thank you, Essen. Thank you so much, Dr. Rakesh. Such an excellent presentation. Um, I'm Noreen, um, and I am uh, working as a neuro-oncologist, pediatric. Um, since my training completed in 2014 from sick kids. So um, we have started our training um, from sick kids um, from 2014 with, a, with, a, with our first multi-institute international tumor board with, the, with sick kids, with, uh, with the help of Eric and Vijay and Uri and uh, all those colleagues, Cynthia and uh, Ute. And, and uh, then, the, then the journey started. Um, so as you have mentioned, that um, like we, we, we have tried to develop some, some uh, immunohistochemical stains in our um, uh, pathology lab as well. So we have also started this uh, beta ketanin, um, GAB1, um, uh, P53 in our patients because um, previously we were doing, the, we were sending our samples to sick kids for the nano string test it was being done by Cynthia, but uh, right now we don't have funds. So, uh, so we are doing um, like the radiological surrogate markers and the uh, and the immunostochemistry for our patients. We have also tried this carboplatin and still it's going on in our uh, uh, metastatic high-risk medulloblastoma patient. And we also had great result, like out of the 10, we have given this carboplatin, daily carboplatin as a radiosensitizers. We have around more than 70% patients who survived and only two patients died um, with the metastatic medulloblastoma. So, so the key here, as you have mentioned very rightly, is the twinning. We can't like, we have more patients than maybe sick kids or St. Jude's and any, any other big centers, but we don't have those resources. So twinning is the way forward. As we have developed at AKU first with Indus, um, uh, where my colleague, Dr. Ahmer is also doing an excellent work. So um, for the last two years, we have started the national twinning with other centers of Pakistan. So we have included 10 or 12 centers of Pakistan, and we are uh, basically helping them to develop their own capacity of pediatric neuro-oncology. So after international twinning, we have started a national twinning at the national level. So um, in this national twinning, we have basically had three tumor boards, uh, mm -hmm. which we are running for the last two and a half years. 
with, diff with all these centers and covering most of the provinces of Pakistan and they have presented their data. So um, and over the time I've seen the improvement in the outcome, in the management, and in many things which my colleagues in the other centers have been doing, and they have tried their level best to develop this capacity. So there is still a long way to go, but you know, that's it's just like a start um, of, of this thing. And it's really, really heartening to see all the efforts that these people are doing with the work because we are a private hospital. So we don't have that much kind of a patient, that, that number of patients, but they do have, and you know, they are doing an excellent work. And I think I'm sure that they're also doing in uh, India as well. So the other thing we have started is uh, last year, we have uh, had our first pediatric neuro-oncology symposium. I think that's uh, one of its kind from the low middle income country. And it was a success. So we have more than 1200 participants around the world. And uh, this year, we are also expecting our second pediatric neuro-oncology symposium to be scheduled on 12th and 13th November. And many of the uh, um, uh, faculties or uh, colleagues you have mentioned in your papers, like Michael Taylor, Peter Dirk, um, uh, Stephen Fister, Skies, Roger Packer, Eric, Kenneth Cohans, they are also, uh, they are uh, our uh, speakers um in that symposium so i will i will invite you at some point in time so thanks again uh thank you dr Athar. thanks asan and thanks dr akish thank you dr noreen thank you that was very nice dr noreen i think we interacted last year in the past no meetings so that is the way to go i mean just a couple of quick uh, points just to just to mention you know all these people are have been extremely instrumental for us also in the beginning but ultimately you know maybe Athar can help us we can do tumor boards between both of us, PASNO and ISNO. In fact, this morning, just by chance, we had the National Cancer Grid Neuro-Oncology Tumor Board where we discussed six cases together from all over the country. So we can schedule it accordingly because our problems are similar, the follow-ups and patient profile and so on and so forth. As far as the profiling is concerned, I don't know how much you were paying for the nano string, but I don't know how it is possible because of the situation otherwise, but if the blocks could be sent to Mumbai, it will be done in 15, 20,000 rupees. I don't know how much it is Pakistan rupees. It's not so expensive. And maybe we can look at that also to help some of the patients from across the across the country. I think that's and a great idea. Uh, yeah. Some of the collaborative work, uh, just pulling the patients together, we can actually beat the world and uh, the number of expertise and the number of patients that we have. That's a great idea. Thank you, sir. So we have a question from Dr. Hamza. Hamza, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Asan. Uh, Akish thank... Hamza, Hamza is, a, is, a, is an upcoming neurosurgeon. So, right. you know, he, he, his, his brain is still functioning until he gets into the emergency <laughs> program. Then he stopped to function. Okay, all right. Dr. Nam, you're very kind. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Akish. I've been particularly very interested in the work you've done regarding uh, guidelines for LMICs and uh, particularly about the things that you've identified in developing the recommendations for our infrastructure. And I was very uh, interested in what you talked about, uh, the applicability of de-escalation in treating low disease burden cases. Could you speak about that in the context of LMICs, particularly when we've noticed within our centers, particularly about patient follow-ups being an issue, patients going off and not receiving the proper chemo radiotherapy regimens, and then coming back with even worse disease. So could that be more applicable within LMICs? What do you think? I have to say de-escalation is still under prospective studies. It's not as a part of routine practice. So you have to be a little bit careful till we validate and till we get more long-term outcome data out of it. Although many people are studying that. But as I just briefly mentioned, if you develop a little bit sense from the radio genomically and you feel that is likely to be a wind pathway and is going towards in somewhere towards the brainstem or to the CP angle, maybe you can you may try to leave a little bit too much if it is challenging of course you try to remove every single bit of it as as safe as it is possible so that is one part of it but in oncology as you know, you know the first chance is the best chance whatever it takes you have to be really really careful and do whatever it takes to institute the therapy right at the beginning uh, what happens in our country like i'm sure it must be the same with you that once the patient comes first of all you have to make sure about the surgical aspect but we don't talk too much about the adjuvant therapy but in, at least in the Brain Tumor Foundation of India, we used to give them a three months protocol that don't think that 10 days surgery and then everything is over. It is actually a three to four months 
stay and look at the accommodation, look at the, all the aspects right from the beginning. Or while the surgery is being done, wherever they may go to back to their own home city, hometowns, liaise with the oncology team right from the beginning. Mm. And whether it is the molecular, whether it is the pathology. The BTF India, even now, any patient or any child who needs medulloblastoma profiling, MGMT promoter methylation for GBM, BRAF mutation for pilostic and PXAs or gangliogliomas, or 1P19Q for oligodendrogliomas, they just have to send the block to BTF Foundation in Bombay, and it is done free of charge. Any, any patient. So typically every week, they get between 20 to 30 samples from all over the country. So that is funded. It doesn't cost so much, actually. It is just, it's just the organization part of it, which is logistic is difficult. But once you crack it, and then what happens is if you do that, and some referring doctor, maybe from, I don't know, Peshawar or Islamabad, they will become you know, your collaborator. They will make sure that the patient is done well. And with the digital era, they will give you the follow-up. The continuum of care is very well. And the other two things what we have done is, which I'm sure maybe you have also done, just employ two relatively young people and just give them mobile phones. Everyone has a mobile phone these days. And we did actually a study, a randomized study where we can do the both. So small, small things that you can do to uh, incorporate even in an LMIC setting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, there is Dr. Abdul uh, Karim Mahiuddin also um, from Malaysia. I think he had a question. Uh, but uh, so, you know, uh, just following the BT uh, Brain Tumor Foundation India, uh, the BTF pack was also established. Uh, Komal Sayyid was part of it. And then we interact on a regular basis uh, with uh, the group, uh, uh, both IBTA, International Brain Tumor Association, and uh, the uh, Indian counterparts. Uh, and it's a, it's a really uh, very good sessions that we are doing on a regular basis. It is I don't know if if Ms. Komal Sayed is here at this point or not, um, it would be nice to hear her because what you mentioned, Rakesh, about uh, how the uh, Indian uh, uh, Brain Tumor Association is doing all this work, that's what we plan to do eventually. FASNO is more of an academic and research uh, society, but then through the BTF pack, we want to look at from the patient's perspective and what we can deliver to them. Uh, so I don't know, maybe Komal is not here anymore. She would have given some uh, comment on that one. Dr. Abdul Karim, do you want to uh, say something about uh, uh, this from the Malaysian perspective? Assalamu alaikum. Good evening to everybody. Uh, I'm very much pleased to participate in this. And it was an excellent uh, presentation by Professor Rakesh Jalali. And the experts made their uh, best comments and I also uh, want to uh, congratulate the presenter. And the medulloblastoma is uh, very well known and it, uh, it, it, it has got its own complications uh, unless it is uh, diagnosed very early and uh, the proper uh, treatment is given to them. Uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, all the points have been very well brought out and uh, I must congratulate the Pakistani team and Indian team who's doing an excellent work here. Um, that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, okay, sir. So we any have other one questions? more. Any other Sorry, question? sir? Yeah. Any other questions we have? Uh... Okay, so this one question, and uh, I just want to... A lot of praises, uh, uh, Dr. Jalali, for you. So that's making me jealous. I'm going to cut it short now, okay? Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> you don't want to bring a star and then just like... Uh, I mean, a point comes and you say that's enough is enough. All right. Okay. Sorry. There is a question. Ahead. Last. We can just take one more question and then we can right, wrap right, it. Up. So, right. so I think the question is from Vida Javin saying that will you escalate the treatment to high risk chemo protocol for anaplastic medulloblastoma histology despite fulfill SR criteria by Chang staging? Oh, absolutely. Large cell anaplastic has been time and again shown to be an aggressive variant. And irrespective of the resection, metastatic status, or the age, if it, they have LCA, it automatically goes into high risk. So you have to treat it like a high risk protocol. And frequently, we use carboplatin in them, irrespective of the stage. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, most of them fall into group three or 
P53 butane sonic hedgehog, which we already know is aggressive. So therefore, unfortunately, LCA has to be treated as a as an aggressive variant, high risk. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, okay, we don't have any more question. I would ask, uh, I'd like to request Dr. Juma and Dr. Inam for the final comment. Some comments, remarks? No, for final, comment is, uh, final, uh, final comment is, is that uh, it, it was an excellent session, a, a great learning, and, uh, um, you know, this is the kind of uh, uh, session that we were really hoping for uh, when the PASNO uh, and, and the webinar program was being uh, formulated. Uh, so it's going to be tough for the people who follow to give up the kind of standard that you set today, Dr. Rakesh. I thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Well, uh, so my, my only, I, 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 I'm going to take some good things from here. So, you know, the idea of uh, doing this twining between uh, us or, or, you know, collaboration, uh, both research wise and uh, clinical pathways wise, that's what I look forward to, Rakesh, really. I, I, I want to follow your path. That's what I can say. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jalali, for such an excellent talk, for being here with us. And we look forward to working and, with and you. And thank you to Sharif Charania for arranging all this thing. Sharif, I forgot totally about uh, thanking you. It's, <laughs> as always, it, the, the stalwart, the man behind all these things. Thank and you. thank you, the Asan Ali Khan, too. Right, thank right. you for making the session so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you all. So, okay, bye bye. Take care. Have a nice weekend and see you soon. Me too. Good afternoon. Bye. 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 bye.